So far we've been looking at the terms of a contract. And we've said, look, when you're reducing things to writing, they're going to be terms of the contract. We've also looked at reasonable notice. Um, but it's also you also need to be aware that not everything the parties say to each other when they're forming the contract becomes a term of the contract. To help understand this better, the courts distinguish between a term, which is part of the contract, and a representation, which actually isn't part of the contract. So what is a representation? Well, a representation is a statement of fact that's made before the contract to induce the other party uh, to enter the contract. So, it, so it's kind of a bit like puffery um, in offers versus invitation to treats. Now importantly, these statements of fact don't form part of the contract. So if they're breached, there'll be no action under the contract. You, you might have an action under misrepresentation or consumer law, but in terms of the contract, it's not considered a term, so there's no breach. How does the court determine whether something is a term or a representation? Well, to do that, it looks at the intent of the parties. So what did they intend? Did they intend this to be a term of the contract or did they not? And there are some essential elements um, to working out whether the parties intended it to be a term of the contract or not. And they are, number one, the thing we need to note is that this is an objective test. That means it's not what the parties actually thought, it's what a reasonable person would so the test is, what would a reasonable person who, know, who is aware of all of the circumstances surrounding this negotiation and contract, what would they believe the intent of the parties to be? Would they believe the intent is that it would be a term of the contract? Or would they believe it's just a statement made to try and talk the other one into entering into the contract? And to help us with that, there are three essential uh, factors that the courts look at to distinguish a term from a representation. And they are the time lapse between the statement and the final agreement. So the longer the time between when the statement's made and when the agreement occurs, the more likely it's, it'll be treated as a representation or an inducement to enter the contract rather than a term of the contract. The importance the parties place on the particular representation. The more important, the more likely it's a term of the contract. And did any of the parties, did one of the parties to the bargain have any special knowledge or skill? Where they have any special skill or knowledge that the other party doesn't, then the statement is more likely to be a term rather than a representation. So three key things. Time lapse, importance, special skill or knowledge gap between the parties. To better understand this, let's look at a couple of cases. The first is Dick Bentley Productions and Harold Smith Motors. So as with a lot of these cases in contract, it's to deal with the it's to do with a deal for a car. So Harold Smith Motors is selling a uh, selling a car to Bentley Productions, so the car is going to go this way, and of course the money is going to go that way as part of the deal. As part of this, um, Harold Smith Motors makes a statement, and he, and he makes a statement saying the car's only been driven, you know, 20,000 miles. And that statement was actually untrue. But Harold Smith made it believing that it was true. So there wasn't a misrepresentation, um, but there was a mistake in this statement where he said it was 20,000 when in fact it was 100,000. Okay, then um, Dick Bentley finds out that it actually has travelled 100,000, finds that after he's bought the car, and he had to get a new engine installed and so sues for uh, breach of contract. And to get that, he's got to actually make out that this representation here, that this statement, sorry, this statement that it had only been driven 20,000 miles has to be a term. 
Now we've said the way to look at this is from an objective person's perspective and say, would a reasonable person looking at all the circumstances expect that this statement be a term of the contract? And we look at the timing. Was it made close to the deal? Um, which it was. We look at how important this issue was. So is the uh, mileage of a car important to its sale and sale value? And yes, it is. And we also look to whether one of the parties had special knowledge or skill. And here we have Harold Smith Motors who do have a special skill. And that was one of the key things that the court held. That they said, look, the distance travelled by the car is a term of the contract. Harold Smith Motors uh, had special knowledge and skill. And Dick Bentley Productions relied on their statement. And so a reasonable person um, would actually find that the parties intended that statement be a binding contractual term. Notice here particularly the skill and special knowledge of the party who made the representation. So a contrasting case is Oscar Chess and Williams. In this case you've actually got Williams selling the car to uh, Oscar Chess Limited who is a used car dealer. Okay, so this is about a, a kind of consumer selling to a used car dealer. And during part of those negotiations, Williams shows the car dealership, Oscar Chess, some papers that said the car is a 1948 model car. Well, later on, Oscar Chess actually find out it's a 1939 model. So it's a much older car than what Williams made out or what the paperwork Williams had actually said. So the issue here becomes whether or not this statement as to the age, is that a term of the contract and so it's a breach or is it merely a representation, a statement of fact, meant to induce the other party to actually enter the contract. You'll remember that there are three things that we're going to look at with our reasonable person test. Would an objective person looking at all of the circumstances expect uh, that the parties intended that to be a term? We're going to look at the time between the statement and the deal the importance the parties would actually put uh, on that piece of information and whether the person making the statement had uh, any special skill or, or knowledge. Okay. Three key factors to distinguish a term from a representation. And what did the court say? Based upon the context of this transaction, the parties had not intended it to be a term. As an experienced dealer, Oscar Chess should have been able to confirm the age of the vehicle for themselves. And so the statement was a non-contractual representation. Notice the difference here, that in this case, the party who uh, the term was made to had the knowledge. It wasn't the person making the representation. So because of that, they're going to say, look, this was an inducement rather than a term of the contract. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an understanding about the difference between something that is a term and becomes part of the contract and those things that are just representations, part of the negotiating and bargaining process that are meant to induce someone to enter the contract.